So Professor Neve Brennan is Michael McCormack Professor of Management at University College Dublin and founder, academic director of the UCD Center for Corporate Governance. Uh, uh, Professor Brennan is a first class honors, first class UCD science, microbiology and biochemistry graduate. Uh, she qualified as a chartered accountant with KPMG, holds a PhD from University of Warwick and is a chartered director of the Institute of Directors. Uh, we have over 100 publications. She has an edge index of 29 reflecting more than 5,000 Google Scholar citations. In recognition of her research, uh, Neef was elected to the Royal Irish Academy in 2020, so this year, uh, elected to the Royal Irish Academy, Ireland's highest academic owner and the first business school academic to be so recognized. Uh, this is a, a great distinction indeed. And Neef also received uh, our academic award and was in, inducted into the Interdisciplinary Accounting Research Hall of Fame in 2019. Uh, Professor Brennan's papers received uh, Best Paper Awards from the British Accounting Review, the Mary Parker Follett Award from um, AAAJ, Accounting, Auditing and Accountability Journal, and, and a highly commended award as well. And uh, she also has a Best Article Award from Accountancy Ireland. She has received four Best, review, uh, four best uh, Paper Review Awards uh, as well. Uh, Professor Brennan is an Associate Editor of the British Accounting Review Accounting Auditing Accountability Journal and Accounting uh, Forum. Other, in, in, in terms of also her involvement uh, uh, outside the, the academic, the immediate academic community, she holds as held non-executive directorships with a number of institutions in Ireland. Uh, she also chairs the Irish Government's Commission on Financial Management and Control Systems in the Health Service and was also vice chair of the Irish Government's Review Group on Editing. Uh, uh, Neef is an inaugural honorary fellow of the Institute of Directors in Ireland and an honorary fellow of the Society of Actuaries in Ireland. So it, it's a very distinguished uh, academic and, and in terms of her uh, input and, and, uh, and, and contribution also outside of academia in terms of corporate, particularly in corporate, corporate governance. Personally, I have been, uh, in my own kind of humble way, I've been very much impressed by her work. I read the work on impression management, her joint work on impression management, and very much a lot of work on insights on corporate boards and governance. Uh, uh, Neve has been an active supporter, as far as I can remember, of, of BAFA throughout the years, uh, notably in relation to uh, being there all the time for doctoral masterclasses, and was very good and very direct comments, but very constructive and very helpful. Uh, if you're not aware of it, she's got two articles, what I call a hundred rules of a game, what I've seen as hundred rules of a games articles in AAAJ on publishing and, and completing a PhD. So I would, I would suggest it's required reading for all, not just PhD students, but I think a very useful uh, 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 pointers and, and, and tips from, from, from Neve. So without further uh, delay, I therefore invite uh, Professor Neve Brennan, our DEA awardee, to deliver her address uh, entitled, Connecting Earnings Management to the Real World, What Happens in the Black Box of the Boardroom? Neve, over to you. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks very much, Stephen um, and Stuart, for hosting um, this webinar. And thanks to the support I received from uh, Tracy Shorrock uh, from BAFA. Uh, thanks to all of you for attending the webinar. I hope you enjoy it. Um, I am extremely grateful to um, former President Lisa Jack uh, and to my BAFA colleagues for uh, awarding me the 2018 uh, British Accounting and Finance Association Distinguished Academic Award. Thank you very much. Um, so when I was told that I was going to uh, have to do a, a plenary, I very quickly um, worked out what I was going to talk about. Um, and what I'm going to talk about is marrying my two areas of research interest, uh, one being financial reporting and the other being corporate governance. And um, in financial reporting, I've selected one specific stream of the literature, which is earnings management. If you put the phrase earnings management into Google Scholar, it gets a hot, over 110,000 hits. And then on the corporate governance side, um, at an embarrassingly young age, I got a non-executive directorship of a bank assurance 
financial services company. And, you know, once you have a non-executive directorship experience on your CV, then you get another and then you get another. So I've actually done quite a lot of corporate governance as well as researching it. Um, I have a puzzle. Do you see me there? There I am sitting on the stool, puzzling away. Um, and my puzzle is that notwithstanding how much earnings management research there is, we know remarkably little in terms of what actually happens on the ground um, in accounting and business practice. And this lacuna is regularly um, highlighted by scholars um, in this area. And I'd summarize the lacuna as in terms of where are the human beings in earnings management? Um, Graham Harvey and Raj Gopal um, say that their approach, which I will come back to, focuses on the person who makes the key decision. So their work, they claim, is an exception, but I'll come back to that. But the detailed day-to-day -day practice of earnings management is rarely discussed in the academic literature. I think Vivian Beatty's work on the triad is the nearest to it. But anyway, I started my academic career in my PhD from a kind of helicopter macro per perspective where I did a very, very large sample of firms uh, and I used legit logit regression. But um, after my PhD and, and part of my PhD, I, I collected 250 profit forecasts and I was completely drawn to looking at what do managers say in the profit forecast. So I was increasingly drawn to the micro perspective. Um, and that's really where I am now in terms of my academic research. Um, this quote resonates with me. Um, another person in the literature, Parlett, uh, I think he captures the sentiment in this uh, Emmanuel Kant quote, uh, when he says the separation be between the world as experienced, and that's what I'm interested in, the world as experienced, uh, and the world as it really supposedly is, as described by science. And um, accounting historian Stephen Walker, I think, picks it up nicely as well in his AOS paper, when he probes the multiple roles of accounting in society, as we experience accounting in society. Um, and so I am interested in moving earnings management research um, much more in terms of it happening in its social context and understanding that better. Um, speaking of context, um, company law requires financial statements to give a true and fair view, or as the Americans call it, fair presentation. But what ex do we mean by true and fair view? Although the phrase appears in law, it's not defined, and therefore it's subject to considerable uncertainty. And it, it, it is one of the most difficult areas of judgment, uh, for example, for auditors. So what do the auditing profession say about this? Um, a somewhat dated statement from the uh, accounting pract auditing practices board is, you know, a degree of imprecision is inevitable in preparing all but the simplest financial statements because of the inherent uncertainties and uh, the need to use judgment in making accounting estimates and selecting accounting policies. Financial statements may be prepared in uh, different ways and still present a true and fair view. So um, the Auditing Practice Board accepts that there are more than one way to present financial statements and they're still uh, showing a true and fair view. Um, a more um, recent guidance uh, says that the preparation of financial statements involves judgments by management um, but in relation to the facts and circumstances of the entity. This involves su subjective decisions 
or assessments to, or a degree of uncertainty, there may be a range of acceptable interpretations or judgment. Financial statement items are subject to an inherent level of variability. So a strong acceptance that there's more than one way to present a set of financial statements which give a true and fair view. Um, moving on then to um, the earnings management literature, and there's no consensus on the term earnings management. Um, and there are, broadly speaking, two different perspectives. First of all, there's the view that um, earnings management somehow signals expectations to investors about future cash flows. But the more dominant perspective is the opportunistic perspective that managers adjust earnings to mislead investors. Now, the line on the screen there is to show um, that in fact it's a continuum and the continuum ranges from the more neutral attitude to er towards earnings management to a much more uh, opportunistic perspective. So um, very early in this stream of the literature, the phrase accounting choice appeared. And just taking a quote from Fields et al, any accounting choice is any decision whose primary purpose is to influence either in form or substance the output of the accounting system in a particular way. So that's quite a neutral definition uh, of accounting choice. Um, coming on then to earnings management, again, another quite neutral definition. Um, Davison et al. The use of um, flexible accounting principles that allow managers to influence reported earnings. And I'm going to pause. This bit of the definition I'll come back to. Uh, influence reported earnings causing reported income to be larger or smaller than it would otherwise be. I think that's a very telling phrase, which I will come back to. Then moving to the more opportunistic um, perspective, uh, which is on the back of agency theory. So Catherine Shipper's definition talks about a purposeful intervention in external financial reporting with the intent of obtaining some private gain. And again, the intent word is an important word there. Um, Healy and Whalen uh, define earnings management. Managers use judgment in structuring transactions to alter the financial statements to mislead. Again, a very strong word, to mislead, um, or to influence contractual outcomes. Going back to Catherine Shipper's definition, where she uses the word intent, De Chow and Skinner acknowledge that managerial intent is unobservable, and it is therefore difficult to operationalize intent. And then we come to uh, the last term, which is earnings manipulation. And um, Benish describes that as uh, when company managers violate generally accepted accounting principles. And earnings management and earnings manipulation are not the same. But I'm not sure that the distinction between the two, one is fraud, violating generally accepted accounting principles. That's fraud, fraudulent financial reporting. And I'm not sure that there is a sufficient distinction between earnings management and earnings manipulation. If you think about our tax colleagues, they are extremely careful in the use of the term um, tax avoidance, which is legal, and tax evasion, which is illegal. But I don't see that care in the earnings management, earnings manipulation. Uh, literature. And the distinction is one is within gap and the other it violates gap. Again, it's a continuum and De Chow and Skinner use different phraseology for the continuum from conservative accounting to neutral to aggressive to uh, fraud. 
Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's hard to kind of, again, know where you might be on the continuum. So my next question is, is there a right level of earnings management? Um, and De Chow and Skinner said, we need to define the point at which managers accrues decisions result in too much smoothing so, and so become earnings management. Um, and um, the question is, should managers have any choice? And Healy and Whalen do acknowledge that the elimination of managers' judgments could disadvantage investors. So, and there's a kind of a, a slightly double thing there that managers should have choice. Um, uh, and uh, there's a kind of whiff of badness over earnings management, and yet they acknowledge that it should have choice. Um, the way in which some of the definitions are written, um, it's implicit in the wording used that there is some one magic correct earnings number. There's one truth. Um, and for example, Joshua Ronan from uh, the uh, New York University has written extensively in this area and his colleagues, he, he, he observes, I quote, earnings management is neutral when the stock price is unbiased because the market can see through the bias in the report and value the firm correctly. And the manager is paid in accordance with the truth. So Professor Ronan and his colleagues are trying to find this one truth, this one true number that you can pay managers against. Um, Davison et al. Uh, used the term an accurate economic picture. Now, I don't think that any professional accountant or chartered accountant would ever use the A word, accurate. And certainly, I'm constantly telling my students, financial statements are not accurate. They give a true and fair view within a certain limit. But Davison et al. talk about an accurate economic picture. And they go on in their definition, which I paused at and I covered their definition, and they use the phrase, larger or smaller than it would otherwise be. Again, they are hinting implicitly that there is one true earnings number. And um, not even the International Accounting Standards Board conceptual framework takes that sense. Um, the conceptual framework says that financial reports are based on estimates, judgments, and models, rather than exact depictions. Accuracy doesn't come into it. The true number doesn't come into it. There are a variety of acceptable uh, alternatives. Um, I absolutely love this diagram from the American Accounting Association and the Inst American Institute of Certified Public Accountants. And um, this um, diagram, which is a joint venture, so to speak, between the academics and the practitioners, this diagram is saying there is no one truth, that there is a perception, possibly amongst our students, for example, that there is one truth. But the academic association and the practitioners are saying this is just a perception and um, it's not a right perception. Um, I love this diagram and I use it in all my financial reporting um, courses. Um, so I'll just point out a few things on the left-hand side, the red diagram. Um, the perception uh, is that accounting is uh, black and white, that accounting is right and wrong, that accounting is yes and no. And that is the perception that a lot of people have about accounting. But moving over now to the right-hand side of the diagram, the reality, here is what accounting really is, according to these two august bodies. Um, it's about critical thinking. It's about accounting judgments. It's about shades of gray. Um, so moving into the literature around earnings management, and the literature um, is based on some 
largely taken for granted assumptions. And BAFA's 2016 distinguished academic, Geoffrey Unaman, um, his paper is out now in the British Accounting Review. And um, Geoffrey Unaman cautions against these taken for granted assumptions. He calls them unrealistic and idealistic, uh, embedded in research. And he uses a very brilliant, forceful phrase, deified with evangelism. Um, so let's look at some of the taken for granted assumptions in the earnings management um, literature. The first assumption is premised on the male fides assumptions of agency theory, that managers are assumed to be self-interested, me, myself, self-interested. And by the way, the mathematical equations on which these, this research is based, you couldn't get the maths to work out without there being very simplistic assumptions. Um, Heslin and Donaldson um, say that managers will steal the silver, quote unquote, unless incentivized to do otherwise. And um, Jensen and Meckling's agency theory model uh, rests on the assumption that the manager will steal what he does not own and that it is probably more efficient to give it to him at the outset rather than put him to the trouble of stealing it. Um, um, and that is a quote, by the way, from Michael Brennan, no relation. Um, he objects to the cynicism of um, agency theory, that assumption that you have to give him the silver to incentivize him not to steal the silver. And uh, Michael Brennan goes on to say that actually people like that should be replaced in organizations rather than tolerated. People with that kind of mindset should not be uh, working in organizations. Um, and there is a stream of research that shows that the assumptions of agency theory have become kind of auto-suggestive, self-fulfilling prophecies, maybe contributing to the low standards, low moral standards in business. So that's the first assumption, uh, self-interest under agency theory. And the second assumption in this stream of the literature, you're looking at a board of directors. And the um, second assumption coming from Fama and Jensen, for example, is that the board of directors is the apex of decision control in organizations that ratifies and monitors important decisions. And the research connecting earnings management and boards of directors adopts this taken for granted assumption. In researching this plenary, I came across an absolutely knockout paper by Franklin Gewurz on the historical and political origins of corporate boards of directors. And he counter argues this assumption. And, and he says that the puzzle arises because of a clash between the model of the corporate board as the supreme body, which is the taken for granted assumption in the earnings management literature. Um, and he then goes on to talk about the minor, the reality of the minor role that corporate boards actually play in the governance of most companies. And that resonates hugely with me because you might think that as a non-executive director, you have a lot of power, but if you've ever been a non-executive director, you will realize you have remarkably little power. I'm not saying that boards shouldn't exist. I do think they fulfill a useful function, but I just do not think they are the supreme, all-powerful body that uh, the literature uh, assumes they are. Um, and, um, Gewurz goes on to say the board's effective control is marginal and he gives a number of reasons for this. The limited time boards have, the reliance on information from managers, and then the rare cases that boards actually exercise a veto over management action. And um, Gewurz thinks about whether you should have a board or whether you should have something like an autocratic CEO 
as the governance structure. And he concludes in favor of having a board on the basis that research shows that decision making is better by groups of people than by a single individual. Um, Gewurz also goes on to say that the um, rationale favored by modern scholars is that boards exist to monitor management, but in his historical um, research on the origins of boards, going back to the Middle Ages, um, he says that um, there, that that assumption, that perspective, ha gets the least support in his historical study of boards. Um, so, um, looking at the prior research on uh, earnings management and boards of directors, so the research tries to find earnings management, it then tries to explain it, um, it assumes that uh, effective corporate governance mechanisms, they're effective because they are good monitors of opportunistic managers. And so um, the research tries to associate earnings management and corporate governance mechanisms, such as the ones up on the slide. And those mechanisms are proxying the monitoring role of a board. Um, you know, the board, the audit committee, independent boards of independent non-executive directors, splitting the role of chair and CEO, um, women on boards, do you see that lovely woman there? Financial expertise on audit committees, interlocking directors, board social ties. Now I'm going to just pick out one of those because it's the one that I personally have experienced. I am a female non-executive director on a board. And when I look at the literature, I just cannot marry it with my own experience as a female non-executive director on the board. Um, so why do the researchers think that women non-executive directors constrain earnings management? And some of the um, reasons, the conjectures for why women constrain earnings managers are their conciliatory nature, I'm going to come back to that one, their risk aversion, their higher mort morality, their ethics. Now, the evidence on connecting women uh, with earnings management is mixed. The results are mixed. Um, just on the assumption, for example, that um, women are better monitors because of their conciliatory nature, well, surely they would be worse managers because of their conciliatory nature. I mean, that to me just doesn't make sense at all. Um, there is a paper uh, that I like a lot for one reason, Gavius, uh, Segev and Yosef. And the reason I like this paper is that um, they distinguish between independent directors and executive managers. And so in their research, they control for female CEOs and female CFOs. So again, it raises the question as to earnings management, non-executive directors, executive uh, directors, so stroke senior executive managers. So most of the research is very quantitative, making, you know, the helicopter perspective, making high level assumptions. So let's have a look at some of the alternative methodologies adopted in this stream of the literature. There you can see somebody conducting an experiment and then you can also see uh, survey research. So experimental research, interestingly, is not consistent with the kind of big regression analysis studies because the experimental research is based on executives, largely the CFO. But a lot of the regression analysis research doesn't even include that as a variable. The, uh, the Sergat paper is an exception to that. Surveys are based on executives. Again, the CFO, not the board of directors. So as I see it, these, um, this stream of research is implicitly and acknowledging and explicitly acknowledging that the key decision maker is the CFO. And you know where the women on boards as non-executive directors come into it, I just don't know. I also um, am a little bit surprised at some of the survey research conducted, by the way, by uh, exceptional academics in the US. But um, Dutchef et al. in their survey, they uh, 
say that an astonishing 20% of CFOs say that 20% uh, of public companies use discretion within GAP, within GAP to intentionally misrepresent their earnings. And they go on to say they use the P word. I, I find it shocking that they use the P word. They go on to say that fully one third of perpetrators. Now that P word perpetrator is a word that I'm familiar with in my forensic accounting research where you're dealing with fraud. So the fact that on the one hand they talk about discretion within GAP and yet call their um, subjects perpetrators, uh, to me uh, it's a kind of subliminal um, subconscious bias I think coming through in their paper that they actually think that within GAP earnings management is actually uh, uh, earnings manipulation. They asked CFOs uh, what how, how much earnings management they thought was going on to intentionally uh, misrepresent earnings. How does a CFO know the answer to that question? Where did the CFOs come up with 20%? What evidence did they have to support their 20%? What data does one CFO have to be able to say, oh, well, generally, 20% uh, of people are intentionally their, uh, misrepresenting their earnings. And I'm sure, by the way, if they were asked the question, and do you do that, there'd be 100% uh, saying no. And yet they're saying, well, 20% of other companies do it, but not us. Um, and um, Why do De Chef et al. call their subjects perpetrators? So that brings me on to kind of where does that lead us? And, you know, the earnings management literature currently addresses questions like, can markets see through earnings management? What incentives have managers got to engage in earnings management? How do the monitoring devices, the board, the audit committee, uh, influence earnings management? So those are the kind of questions that the literature currently addresses. But I'd like to kind of, I'd like to, I'd like research to address questions like, to what extent are non-executive directors, female board members, audit committees involved, if at all, in accounting choice, in earnings management? Because I've never experienced it. Now, I have never been a non-executive director of a publicly listed company. Um, so my experience is, I fully admit, somewhat limited. How do managers and non-executive directors interact in relation to accounting choice? And Vivian Beatty's work is the beginning of trying to unpack that. And it's difficult to unpack. And um, what boardroom processes, if any, are followed during financial statement preparation that addresses earnings management issues? Um, and I think that we need to go about um, research in relation to corporate governance boards of directors using a completely different approach to get under the skin uh, the micro perspective of what's actually going on. Methods such as the one there. And I, can, I know you're thinking this. I can just read your mind. I know you're thinking, oh, Neve, that kind of research isn't possible with boards of directors. Well, actually, that's not true. Uh, there are participant observation studies on boards. There's, uh, uh, um, Samra Fredericks does gorgeous, eth has done gorgeous ethnographic research. There is some case study research. But anyway, a group of researchers at Queensland University of Technology um, have adopted a method of research that is just an incredible game changer. And that is they have started to videotape um, board meetings. So Bessemer, Nicholson and Pugliese, and they've got about four or five papers out on the six board meetings that they videotaped. And that's the first time it was ever done. They have looked um, using the video recordings at board interactions, the pattern of director interactions, the process of accountability, board habitual routines, and the influence of board chairs. And the 
two photographs there are photographs from a D governance student of mine who's almost finished her DGov uh, dissertation. And they're photographs of the two boards that she has videotaped. Now, she's not looking at earnings management either. She's actually looking at a very under-researched aspect of boards, which is the challenge. Bo board members are meant to challenge management. Beyond that, we know nothing. So that is uh, the focus of her research. Um, given the 110,000 plus hits on Google Scholar around earnings management, um, it does kind of make beg the question, like, has all of this research made a difference? Um, are companies impacted by this research? How have the evidence of earnings management research impact influenced financial reporting practices, auditing, boards, audit committees? How have they influenced the policy makers? Um, and I'll just leave that question with you, but I couldn't find a huge amount of evidence that actually was making much difference at all to the practice of um, financial reporting. So to summarize, the key takeaways from my uh, presentation are that we know a lot about earnings management from a high level helicopter perspective, but we know remarkably little from a micro perspective what happens on the ground. And I think that um, we need to complement our um, quantitative colleagues um, by approaching earnings management research, asking different questions, and by addressing those different questions using different methodologies. So thanks very much for listening to me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Nif. That was a very much, uh, very good you know, on, on time, I would say. A very interesting, very stimulating points. I just, uh, as you were discussing, I, I, I thought of Ruth Hines, of the communication and creation of reality. I was, I was yeah. very, uh, kind of almost a required reading, I think, when, when, when we kind yeah. of get the notion yeah. of accounting. Yeah. Uh, this is just comment, really. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and, and it's good to hear about from your own experience as a minor role of boards, you know, the, the yeah. fact that perhaps boards are, are given as such a, uh, perhaps one, I, I will leave it to, uh, to, to, to Stuart to, I mean, to see if there's anyone with questions. I saw a comment from, from Atul about the, um, you know, uh, the, the experience, the, the fact that perhaps we, we, we uh, do not consider experience as being uh, useful. Uh, but yeah, I don't know if you want to reply to that. Is, is experience? Um, uh, well, the only variable that comes in that is vaguely related to experience would be financial expertise mm -hmm. on an audit committee. So that is a variable in this research. Um, um, you know, um, means by the word experience. Okay. I'll leave it to questions from Stuart. Do you want to? Is there any questions from the um, from the floor? Here we are. We've got Christopher Napier has got a question. So Christopher, I'll just unmute you and then uh, you can start speaking. Thank you very much, and thank you, Lee, for a really stimulating uh, talk. Uh, I think that uh, uh, the sort of the key insight I'm taking away from that is that. Uh, uh, the board of directors itself doesn't really have anything significant to do with uh, accounting policy decisions. And I think that it reminded me of the, uh, the Tesco scandal a few years ago, where the accounting policy choices and, 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 and the small manipulations that uh, led to a big overstatement of profit were really taking place quite low down in the organization. Yeah. So at best, the only role that the role the board of directors has is possibly setting uh, tone from the top, messages coming down, we need to push profits this year. And the, the actual detailed decisions are really taking place quite low down in the organization. Yeah, um, that's a nice observation, um, Christopher. And um, I am on, I have been on boards. And if you're a chartered accountant, you're a sitting duck to be on the audit committee. And um, so here's the kind of exchange between me and the external auditors. Um, I, I, this is one just to give you, just to tell you what it's like. Um, 
um, I, I always ask the question, um, what level of materiality did you apply in the audit? And I asked this um, on the board of the biggest organization I was a non-executive director of. Uh, and um, the audit partner said, I don't think I should uh, answer that question. Now, you, you, you could hear the jaws crashing onto the table. And in fact, that audit partner was rotated off the audit very quickly. <laughs> but you know, the audit partner refused to answer my question, which is a perfectly reasonable question. But you have to ask yourself, why would the external auditor even behave like that? My other standard question is, uh, when the financial statements come to the audit committee, I say to the external audit partner, the uh, engagement partner, on a scale of one to 10, between very prudent and uh, ag aggressive, I said, where on that scale does uh, this company fall or these financial statements fall? A large number of words pour out of the audit partner's mouth, at the end of which, I have no idea what he said. Um, bamboozle the board. Now, when, the, when we have the private meetings between the audit partner and the board with management not present, um, the side of the mouth talking continues, but a little bit less so. But I've always wondered why are auditors unwilling to tell the board from the front of their mouths what exactly is going on? And so I kind of think that external auditors, there's a certain kind of collusion I know is a very strong word, but cooperation may be a more neutral term. But there's a certain cooperation between management and the auditors that makes it very difficult for somebody like me as a non-executive director to get answers to perfectly reasonable, straightforward questions. There's a game going on. Thank you. Right. Thanks, Neve. Um, uh, Collins has indicated. Do you want to ask your question, Collins, please? You're on mute now. Okay. D thank you very much, Stuart. And uh, um, thank you very much, um, uh, Neve. Uh, very stimulating um, uh, presentation and agenda for future research. And I think I agree with you on, on terms of the methodological direction. But, but I, ha I have one um, question, which is the behavioral aspect. Um, the idea that once the, the, the camera is switched on, the directors behave differently. So um, you, in the end, you might not be able to really unpack the black box. And I was wondering, uh, given your experience so far, what, what, how, what will you say, particularly for researchers who might be interested in, in turning to this particular direction that you, you are setting out? Okay, that's a great question, um, Colin. Thanks for, very much for that. In relation to the um, group uh, who first did this out of Queensland University of Technology, um, um, I don't want to reveal, I know something about the two boards that they videotaped, but the board members um, in their day job were extremely used to being filmed. Um, and uh, they, the researchers um, uh, believed that uh, because of that level of comfort with their work day-to-day -day work being filmed, that they didn't feel that the behavior changed. Um, in relation to my student, uh, um, she has told me that, you know, she rigs up the camera and that she too feels that, um, you know, they forget that the camera is on. You know, they may, you know, I mean, the board meeting goes on maybe for two hours. Um, where I think, Colin, um, I'd, I'd kind of re-express your question, and that is um, about the extent to which extremely sensitive issues, like, for example, earnings management, or like, for example, Tesco's recognizing revenue too soon. I, I just have a question mark as to, you know, the extent to which such sensitive issues even come into the boardroom in the first place. And whether, um, using John Roberts' terminology, whether boards are just the performativity 
of governance, whether they go through the motions, whether it's just some kind of ceremonial corporate governance dance, or are they at all discussing the really, really important issues? And an awful lot of board work happens outside the boardroom. So, you know, there'll be a lot of private discussions, possibly of these things between, let's say, the chair, there would be private discussion between the chair of the audit committee and the auditors and that like. So maybe those private discussions get up to the sensitive issues. Um, um, but the two boards, uh, um, the, the QUT boards and my students boards, they wouldn't be in sensitive type of areas um, as far as I know. Right, okay. Thanks Collins for the question, thanks Nave. Um, got a kind of comment, although it leads into a bit of a, a question, another area to discuss from John Cullen, where he says, thanks for an interesting presentation. In terms of the last slide, it's interesting that you include research by practitioners. To me, this links very closely with the idea of co-production of research involving mm -hmm. academic researchers and practitioners working together to contribute to the literature. And also, uh, a, a kind of a, on a slightly different, well, on a different topic as well from Ramshah, uh, a straightforward kind of question, I suppose. So do you think auditors should be paid by the regulators? Um, well, um, um, we have an example of auditors uh, paid, not so much by the regulator, but, uh, and by the way, the regulator themselves, the Financial Reporting Council has been absolutely slated for its passive turn a blind eye approach to regulation. So having regulators paying auditors, you assume that somehow regulators would be better, uh, uh, their external uh, versus internal, but the evidence doesn't support that at all. It, there's some sense of regulatory capture um, between the auditing profession and, for example, the Financial Reporting Council. Um, but there is, um, there is a sector where we have, um, um, we have a state auditor. So you have the National Audit Office, I think it's called in the UK, and we have the Controller and Auditor General. And um, the question is, are those auditors better than, for example, the big four? My answer is they're different but they're not necessarily better. So our controller and auditor general loves to get a headline in the newspaper. So they will go after completely immaterial items like, you know, what rest, fancy restaurant did the CEO bring a group out to? And that will end up in the newspapers. So uh, they have a very different perspective, which, which they are definitely more independent, but I wouldn't go as far as to say their audits are uh, better quality um, audits. Um, where I think the weak link in corporate governance is that company law gives the shareholders the right to um, fix the remuneration of the auditors. And they are under law, the company law gives the shareholders the option of delegating that task to, uh, in effect, management. And I think the fact that the shareholders, like if you want auditors to look after your interests, then you have to be the one that pays them. So the shareholders propensity to delegate that legal right to management, I think explains a lot. And you could come back and say to me, oh, well, Neve, it'd be so impractical for it to happen otherwise. Well, I don't know. I kind of think there could be a way of the shareholders retaining that one function some way or another. And if they did retain that right, that legal right, I think they would get a much better service from auditors. But the impression I have is that auditors, I wonder whether they think the client is management because management pays them and they lose sight of the fact that they're meant to be looking after the shareholders' interests. Um, also as well, there was John Cullen's question about co-production of research. Um, well, I thank you, John, for that question. It allows me to um, just tell you about the fact that in 2002, I got a rush of blood to the head and I set up the UCD Centre for Corporate Governance. And I was the first to offer director training in Ireland because I said to myself, you know, 
I knew nothing when I joined my first board. It didn't stop me accepting the offer of the position. And I just said, there's lots of other people out there like me. They need uh, director training. But the most fantastic thing about bringing directors into a university is that you're beginning to open the black box of the boardroom. And some of my PhD students have used those my customers, so to speak, in the Centre for Corporate Governance have used them uh, to um, uh, get access to boardrooms. And I have a paper actually in AAAJ with the company secretary of the Electricity Supply Board, the Irish Electricity State Board, and uh, Colette Kerwin. And we have a paper, thanks to the company secretary, John Redmond, um, I was telling him in the lectures about information asymmetry, and he said, no, no, um, a non-executive director cannot be a good non-executive director unless there is information asymmetry. If the non-executive director knew everything that the executive director would know, knew, there'd be no question for them to ask. So that paper is a completely different perspective than anything else in the literature, thanks to uh, the co-author being a practitioner who, when I said it was about information asymmetry, I'd say he found that offensive because he's there thinking, hold on, I do the best possible job to brief my board as best as I can. And Neve Brennan is now telling me that I am engaging in information asymmetry. So he completely turned it on his head. Um, uh, and I'm, I, I really like that paper. I think it makes a, a significant contribution to the literature in terms of conceptualizing something in a radically different way to compare to the taken for granted assumption. Right. Um, so, yeah, sorry, Richard. Richard McVeigh's had his hand up. Uh, sorry, Richard. Uh, I didn't spot that on the uh, participants list. If you want to go ahead and uh, ask your question to Neve. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks, Nee, very much for the lecture. Let's just take the uh, assumption that earnings management is perfectly acceptable because you've distinguished it at one end from uh, just being neutral. The other end, it's not fraud. Though, in fact, the distinction is probably pretty hard to, to make, as you point out, as it is with tax evasion and for tax avoidance. Um, but let's assume earnings management is perfectly respectable. What we don't know about the decision making is what do people think they're getting out of it? Because yeah. it's not, it's yeah. not uh, costless. If you boost your earnings this year, you may have to depress your earnings next year. Now, you may want to do that deliberately for, for um, yeah. Yeah. You know, smoothing. But that's what we don't know about yeah. earnings management, is what do people think they're getting out of it? Yeah. Um, and obviously you mentioned that the famous paper about the, uh, the real earnings management as well, which, is a, which of course in a sense is, is not fraudulent, it's just bloody bad management. I, I'm, I don't know, I, 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 I... My, I scope limit my paper uh, to accruals earnings management only, um, but I'm not actually. Stick with that. Mm. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm not. I'm not convinced about the research on real earnings management, but I won't even go there. But um, just to answer your question, um, I research impression management which is the spin and bullshit, excuse the phrase, but that was the phrase they used about Fred Goodwin, trying to make it look as if he, he, the acquisitions were valuable to the bidder, that he engaged in spin and bullshit, quote unquote, um, uh, in how he accounted for the acquisitions. Um, but in impression management, they use words to uh, put a golden uh, picture on the performance of the company. And you could ask exactly the same question, like what do the managers think they're getting out of that? Um, um, because you would expect that investors would see through the golden words and would not fall for, you know, uh, uh, the positive spin and all the rest. And equally, you would expect uh, sophisticated investors anyway to, ha it, 
to interpret the numbers, just as he would interpret the words, with a certain amount of skepticism. Um, you know, because we know that managers, uh, well, I, I don't think, I mean, these managers are our former students. So I just don't think they're all out there, um, tr you know, trying to rip off everybody left, right and center. I think an awful lot of them, the majority of them are probably trying to do the best job they can for their company. And they may think that writing a glowing uh, narrative on the performance of the company is putting the best foot forward for the company. And they may also think that, you know, um, managing the numbers for example, so that the company does not report earnings below expectations and the market just crucifies companies that do that. And so a good manager acting in the interest of the company will um, try and meet market expectations because not to is bad for the company. Um, um, and I think the investors have to view uh, financial statements and annual reports just with a certain amount of skepticism, knowing that a bit of that goes on. Yeah, I mean, I agree with you. And that would be what I'm suggesting would be interesting to try and find out. Yeah. What do they actually think? Yeah. Given they're not doing anything illegal. Yeah. So yeah. They, shouldn't, they shouldn't be scared of telling you what they're doing. Yeah. yeah. That's great. Thanks very much, Richard. Uh, we have one last question. So uh, uh, before we're going to wrap up this part of the, uh, the session. So uh, Sheehan Rahman. Hi. Um, so uh, th this was briefly answered by Neve before, but uh, I, I just want to put it out there. I, I think if auditors are paid by regulators, uh, what kind of effect it would have on our normal understanding of agency relationships. For example, I was thinking this kind of a move might give uh, tremendous power to the government indirectly through the regulators over private companies. Um, as an example, just the other day I was reading in Bangladesh, the Security and Exchange Commission uh, was able to fire 19 executives of private companies uh, because they violated certain um, uh, uh, accounting auditing rules. I, I was wondering what what kind of implications it, it, it would have on on uh, expanding government power on on private companies. And um, Sheehan, am I interpreting you right that you think it would improve things? No, no. I think it would give tremendous power to the to the government to influence uh, in, in to influence um, executives internal decision making yeah um, indirectly through the auditors yeah um, um, i think there would be a risk in auditing uh, interfacing with the political process particularly if you think of uh, politicians like donald trump um, <laughs> I, I think it i think it wouldn't have a beneficial effect but in fairness i mean if you take the national audit office in the uk and you, who and which are only auditing state bodies and the uh, controller and auditor general in Ireland, in fairness to those bodies, they are very independent. They're much more independent of their client uh, than, uh, you know, the big four, for example. Um, um, uh, so from an independence point of view, state auditing is better uh, than private sector auditing. Um, in other ways, it's, it's not as good. Um, so I kind of, uh, my gut feeling is that if um, a regulator paid the auditors, um, I kind of think it might fix one problem over there, but another one would pop up elsewhere. Uh, it just, it sounds too good to be true. And I just think it would play out differently than one might assume or expect. Okay, that's great. Listen, we'll, we'll just uh, wrap up this part of the, the session. Uh, I want to thank Neve Brennan, Neve Brennan, Professor Neve Brennan, very much for stimulating a uh, fascinating conversation and, and plenary session. Uh, for everybody for taking the time out, obviously, to come and, and listen.